Ah, 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 you turned 19. Okay. All right. You're still a teenager. Is everyone here a teenager? Is there anyone here who's not a teenager? Ah, okay. Well, the big people on this side of the room. Okay. Let's all sing it. Remember what it was like to be a teenager. On the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jay. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Hooray! 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 Thank you, everyone. Oh, that took great courage. Well done. I, I like that sort of confidence. Shh, shh, shh. I like, I like that. I admire that. Now, um, shh, 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 shh. that reminds me um, of the most unusual uh, proposal we had in our lecture. Uh, early on. And uh, I only found out uh, shortly before the lecture that uh, Janet was going to do that. And she said to me uh, that, uh, and the reason I agreed to it was she said that uh, apparently you guys had initially met. Where are you? Where is he gone? He was here a second. Oh, he's gone. They're off together, finally, uh, <laughs> together. Uh, the, uh, they had met each other at, um, in, in a lecture that I'd run a long time ago or an exam or something like that. So that was just very special and they wanted to get married. And I hope that they, um, you know, have all their important anniversaries in, in my lectures. So. <laughs> so, and, uh, okay, so um, now let's return to the lecture. Let's leave, should we leave the complaining guy up? Okay, all right, look, sorry if, if you like that song and I've made fun of it. Uh, but uh, complaining, bad. Busting loose, doing fantastic things, kicking the ball, good. All right, so we've talked about trees. And we've talked about the problem of Maurice, and Maurice menswear on Marrickville Road. He's got the problem that no matter what happens, there's not enough entropy in the system. Order will leak in and somehow his trees are going to become unbalanced. And this is a problem that we all face when we write software. And all software has this problem. That after iterated use, unless you're absolutely sure that all the data coming in is completely random, patterns of order start to emerge and the trees become unbalanced. So how can we solve this problem? There are several ways. One is not use trees. Yeah, use hash tables or something like that. There's two other approaches, and um, I'll introduce you to one of them, but then I'll tell you about the other, which is my absolute complete favourite all-time approach. One of them is this. Well, the trees need to be balanced. After time, the trees become unbalanced. So we will occasionally rebalance them, like taking your car in. How can you rebalance a tree? Well. Just about every single way of doing it is, is centred around one single very beautiful idea. <laughs> if I've got an ordered tree that looks like this, And I've got, what here, 10, uh, 6, 2, 9, 13. It's an ordered tree because it satisfies the ordering property that all children on the left exceed um, the parent and all children on the right, um, sorry, all children on the left are smaller than the parent, all children on the right are greater than the parent. Let's not worry about collisions, equals, because they just confuse things, but they make no real difference. But there are many other trees, and we mentioned before we had the tree 13, 10, 9, 
six, two. That's another tree, but that's obviously a hopeless unbalanced tree. How can we, without doing much work, because when we rebalance the trees, we don't want to do much work, how can we rearrange this tree to another tree but not doing much work? What's a simple way of rearranging this tree but preserving the ordered property? And um, there are, you could probably think of yourself, many interesting ways of doing it. And probably about the simplest, smallest move you can make is what we call a rotation. So if I wanted to make six the top, what process could I go through to move six to the top? You can see why I want to move six to the top, I hope, which is there's more children on this side than on that side. If six gets to the top, I'm sort of balancing the numbers a bit better. I'm making the tree a bit more balanced. I mean, though it's a perfectly balanced tree in terms of depth at the moment. But in general, that doesn't. So if I wanted to move six to the top, well, how could I rearrange things to move six to the top? Say that again? Yes, we, what we're going to do is we sort of rotate it like this. So the six goes to the top and the ten goes down. That's our rotation in a sense. Previously it went like that, now we've flipped it over to go like that. Now suppose everyone kept their children attached to them. Uh, uh, Oh, well, that's confusing. Well, we can't keep everyone's children attached to them, but that's sort of what we've got. We're going to have to get rid of someone. Which, who do we have to get rid of? Nine. The nine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, small, the larger child of the new root has to move where? The smaller child, the smaller grandchild. Yeah. This is a rotation going one way. And similarly, and I've left all the other nodes off, because all the other nodes can stay exactly as they are. We don't have to move anyone else. Everything else continues to work. Does that make sense? So that's a rotation. You can rotate left and you can rotate right. So one way of rebalancing the tree would be, well, actually, let's pick the really, uh, actually, even simpler than that. We could just empty the tree out completely, permute it completely randomly, and insert the elements back in in random order. And with high probability, that would make a new balanced tree. But that would be a lot of work. We'd have to uh, extract everyone from the tree, which is going to be linear, and then insert them all, permute them, which will be linear, and then insert them all, which is linear. So we've got three linear things going on. That's a lot of work proportional to the whole size of the thing. You could justify that whole lot of work if you didn't do it very often, of course. You could say, normally we're super fast. And every now and then we slow and we do 3n work. And then we super fast from then on. And if we took that 3n work and averaged it over all the accesses to the structure, you know, it gives us this performance or that performance. Another idea is we just use rotations to slowly introduce balancedness to the tree. So as the tree slowly moves out of whack, we just gradually slowly rotate it, trying to keep it back in whack. The many algorithms that use rotations and their variants to balance trees are things like you can create trees called ABL trees or um, red-black trees or Fibonacci uh, or um, splay trees. Uh, and they're all sort of fun, but they're, they involve a fair bit of work. It's a lot of thinking and mechanical processing. The nice things about these trees is they do, um, oh, well, well, my favorite, let me just work out how I want to structure this. Approach number one is um, I'll give a capacitor to the next person to answer this question correctly. <laughs> Approach number one is occasionally we rebalance the whole tree. I call this like the central controller theory. We will be in control of what's going on. We will control everything. We will gather statistics on the tree. We will notice when the tree is not right. We will completely rebuild it and make it balanced when it is not right. 
right? Now that is uh, an okay approach, but it's a centralized controlling approach. And I think of that as like the approach of the 50s and 60s, one master controller in the middle doing all the work and so on and so on. But I like to think we're now moving to this sort of decentralized, more nimble sort of approach, more amenable to things like distribution and things like that. So I don't really like the centralized approach. Another approach is every time someone accesses the tree, we do a tiny bit of work tending to make it more balanced. So over time, the tree will tend to be more balanced and we'll share the work over each thing. I like that. If you could do just some little operation, low cost operation, locally, which had a global effect of balancing the tree, great, making it slightly more balanced, and you iterated that over and the tree tended to be being more balanced. I like that approach. That would really be good. A splay tree has an interesting, but of course these costs, regardless of whether you do the centralized cost or the uh, a little bit of extra work each time cost, nonetheless we're doing a bit of extra work. And this means we'll underperform a, a balanced tree. A balanced tree without all this extra housekeeping will still beat us. And our code is heaps more complex. It's a real yucky job to implement these trees, I claim. Though people that love them claim it's not so hard. But I think it's just error prone and revolting. And if it's in a library, that's great. Use someone's library. But writing itself is very complex. Splay trees have this interesting extra thought, which is, well, OK, using the splay tree and maintaining the balance property, the little bit of housekeeping it does, to make the tree more balanced is a cost, sure, but let's try and put a sweetener in, a, a benefit in at the same time. And maybe on average we'll turn out to be better off. So splay trees, in addition to keeping the tree, doing work to balance the tree each time, they also try and make the tree um, more efficient each time, more optimised. If we're searching a tree, what do we really hope? You want to be accessing things closer to the top. Now, it makes much less of a difference than it would in a list to do this sort of thing. But a splay tree essentially does what the self-organizing lists used to try and do. And when you access an element, they move it to the top. So if you're accessing elements with a non-uniform frequency, over time, as well as balancing the tree, splay trees have the property that the elements you like move to the top and you access them slightly, slightly faster. So they're all sort of good. But I'm not going into them in detail. Uh, uh, though one of them, and I haven't decided which, will be the presentation topic for next week. Oh, would you want to just pick it now? Why don't we say splay trees? Because of them all, I, I, I quite like them. Let's say splay trees are the present. Now, I promised that Dijkstra would be the presentation topic for this week, but then I forgot to put it up. So my plan is this. If you're doing the presentation for this week, it's on Dijkstra. If you don't have enough time to prepare, that's fine. Do the presentation next week. So those tutes will have two, let your tutor know what you're going to do so they can plan around it. So some tutes will have no presentation this week and two next week, and some will have one this week and one next week. Does that make sense? You can decide what you want to do yourself. Um, so the presenters for this week is to explain Dijkstra and prove it's correct. We need the proof. A lot of people gave cross school last week but forgot to give the correctness proof. We need the proof. We need to know it's correct. We don't just want to say it's a neat algorithm. We want to see it's a neat correct algorithm. And, so, and the presentation topic for next week will be splay trees, just to explain how they work. Um, okay. Uh, what other? Oh, uh, bee trees. Another, an interesting. Um, well, look, there are all sorts of fancy trees that people have invented, augmenting the normal binary search tree <laughs> to give them extra nice properties at the cost of extra complexity of implementation and representation. Bee trees, you will see if you ever do a database course. Bee trees are a very nice data structure where. More information is stored in the node than normal. In particular, you can have more children than just two. You can whack a whole lot more in, which means that the tree is much less in depth, has much less depth than, um, than a binary tree. The advantage of this, information-wise, there's not much advantage to this. It turns out the best compaction you can get is when n's a power of two, the number of children's a power of two, and you might as well just make it um, two, and you'll do the same number of comparisons to search the tree, binary comparisons to search the tree. But it has a different advantage, which is if your structures are stored in different sorts of memory, some memory's fast and some's not so fast, you know, like your computer has a cache, which is really fast, and then it has random access memory, which is quite fast, and then it's got your hard drive, which is a bit slower, and then it's got your USB stick, which is slower again, and then it's got, what's slower than a USB stick? What's that? The user. 
<laughs> that's right. I know, I, I laugh a lot when I see people slowly typing a letter on this machine that can do a billion instructions per second, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's quite funny. Uh, yeah, you floppy drive or something. So there's different sorts of ways um, devices attached to the computer which can communicate with it at different speeds. So if you're storing, if you've got lots of data to store and you can't keep it all in RAM, which is fast, and you have to put it in what we call secondary storage, like the hard drive or something like that. So if you've got a huge database, suppose you're Google or Wikipedia or something like that, they've got a bazillion pages. They have to store them all. They can't store them all in RAM. There's not one big computer there with all that stuff stored in RAM. It's stored in hard drives somewhere or other forms of storage. So every access is slow. So you want to minimize the number of accesses. Once you do an access, you get a whole chunk of data. You get a big block back. You get a lot of data back each time you do an access. Data gets transferred in big chunks. But then if you wanted to do another access, you have to wait hours to get it. So it's like getting big boxes shipped to you from France. Okay, it um, takes hours to get there, but you can have a lot in the box. But it's a real pain if it didn't, you know, you wouldn't want to send, you wouldn't want to have a conversation with France a word at a time, traveling in big boxes. You'd want to put the whole conversation in one box and send it out. Uh, so, so the idea is we want to do as few lookups as possible. So a tree, which necessarily involves looking at the node, comparing values with the key, determining which new node to fetch, looking that up, determining which new node to fetch, looking that up, determining... That's a, every one of these lookups is really expensive. So the idea is, well, let's make each lookup return heaps of information, as much information as we can, so we have to do as few discrete lookups as possible. And so databases like that, Google, Wikipedia, are all stored in a database. Databases use B-trees for indexing, um, and they're very popular. Okay. So I've sort of shown you one approach which I subdivided into two categories of keeping trees balanced, which is working hard and cleverly to keep them balanced. One sub-approach of this approach is to do it all up front in a big lump and then occasionally stop and reorganise the whole thing. That's like me with my bedroom. Occasionally I stop and just resort the whole room. And the other way is just do a little bit as you go and keep it reasonably well sorted. And that's actually how my wife sorts her study. She just always keeps it tidy, does a little bit of work every day, it's always tidy. I'm very jealous. I let mine get disgustingly messy, then I do it. Okay, so they're the two sub-approaches. But the second approach, which I like even more, infinitely more in fact, before I can tell you that, I've got to tell you about heaps. So a heap. Shh, 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 shh. Have I, I haven't shown you heaps before. Has Maury shown you heaps before? Yes, some people said yes, some people said no. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to look, let's have a look. A heap is just a tree with an extra property, just like a binary search tree, yeah, is a tree with the sorted property. A heap is a tree with the heap property. This is actually, by the way, I've, it's completely, it's perfectly balanced, isn't it? It's, the bottom row is entirely filled in. That's called a complete binary tree. It's complete if it's actually filled in to the very end. This is balanced but not complete. It's got a little hole at the end. Missing. Um, oh, and actually, I think that is a complete tree. I think, uh, I can't remember. Uh, no, I've got terminology problems. I can't remember. Hmm, there's three words. There's three states you can be in. One of them is complete. I can't remember which it is. Let's call them state one, state two, and state three. State one is an unbalanced tree. Yep, that's state one. That's an unbalanced tree. State true is a balance. State two and three are both balanced. One is balanced with random holes. Yeah, I don't know about complete, so I'm not going to say that word anymore. Random, with random holes in the last row. Yeah, that's balanced with random holes in the last row. And the other one is balanced with holes at the end of the last row. So this is a category two tree. Oh, this is a category three tree. It's got two holes, but at the, at the end. Yep, does that make sense? 
Now, a heap is a binary tree which has a heap property. And the heap property is this. The children are no greater than the parents. Or the parental aspiration heap. The children are no less than the parents. One's called a min heap and one's called a max heap. I don't mind which one we use. Everything's the same. Let's pick um, the min heap. So the smallest guys at the top. So we'll pick one at the top. Then the children here have to both be greater than or equal to one. So this could be six and this could be three. The children here have to be greater than or equal to six. So this could be uh, seven and this could be six. And this could be ten and this could be four. Can you see that? It's not having the same sort of global properties the search tree has. The relationship is only between you and your parents. Nothing across the tree. So the fact that 10 here is larger than 6, or, uh, but uh, 6 is smaller than 10, these have nothing to do with it. OK? That's a heap, a binary heap. Do you remember how selection sort worked? Selection sort, you go along and you pick the biggest guy, or the smallest, say, and you take him out. And then you do another pass along, and you take the smallest or the remainder and you take them out. Then you do another pass along, you take the smallest and you take them out. You keep going, although here I'm oscillating cocktail shaker fashion and actually you just normally go somewhere. But it doesn't matter which way you go. That was selection sort. And then remember I said, oh, although it clearly takes n operations to find the smallest, do we have to really do two n operations to find the second smallest? And we discovered, no, you learn a lot of information on the first pass through that can help you with the second one. And we convert it into quadratic selection sort. Do you remember quadratic selection sort? That's when you divide everyone into groups, say four groups, and you divide everyone into small groups and you keep track of the smallest of each group, and then to get the smallest overall, you just have to take the smallest of the smallest of each groups. So you have to do another comparison between these four to pick the smallest. But once you've then removed the smallest guy out, suppose, uh, let's, let's say, um, suppose the smallest of this, this pile here, suppose the smallest was 6, suppose the smallest of this pile here was 10, suppose the smallest of this pile here was 2, suppose the smallest of this pile here was uh, 5. The smallest overall is the smallest of these which is 2, we can get 2, so we rip 2 out and we now found the smallest overall and it turns out if you add up the amount of comparisons you have to do to find the smallest of this one, the amount of comparisons to find the smallest of this, the amount of comparisons to find the smallest of this, blah, 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 and then the amount of comparisons to select between these four, it turns out, lo and behold, it's exactly the same number of comparisons as to pass along the list. It's still n minus 1 comparisons. But the nice thing is, although we've done n minus 1 comparisons to find the smallest, which is 2, after we've pulled 2 out, how much work do we have to do now to find the second smallest? Heaps less. We don't have to do any work. We don't have to touch these piles. We just have to find the smallest in this pile and pull it out. Does that make sense? And there's no reason we can't do this recursively all the way down. If we did it recursively all the way down, can you see the structure we would get would be a heap? Heaps are very, very nice in this way. They're nice for working out ranked order elements in order, finding the first or the third or the median or so on the middle element. You pull the first guy out, we've only got to do two comparisons to work out who's the next, who bubbles up to the top instead to re-establish the heap property. Does that make sense? So often people use heaps to represent priority queues. The priority queue, right, is something you pull elements out of one at a time and it's always giving you the smallest of who's left or the biggest of who's left, depending on whether you've got aspirational parent syndrome or not. But you, you can represent a priority queue very nicely with a heap. As long as you can represent a heap nicely, then the, then the game's over. So how can we represent a heap? Well, it turns out we can represent a heap very nicely indeed. Provided that we represent the heap as a binary tree of the third type. We represent the heap as a balanced binary tree and it only got holes at the very end. Then it turns out we can actually just literally directly store it in an array. Shh, shh, shh. We don't need to actually have any tree structure at all. Let me um, store this guy in an array. We'll just stick the remaining elements in. What have we got here? Someone bigger than seven? You guys just call out a number bigger than seven. Eight. Number bigger than seven, 42. Number bigger than six? 42. Uh, we're going to get a whole lot of 42s. Number bigger than six? 19. 19. No, happy birthday. Number bigger than 10? 
26. You're very confident. Number bigger than 10? 29. Number bigger than 4? 7,000. Woohoo! That reminds me of an interesting game. Does anyone know the game? Um, how are we going for time? Mediocre? Yes, you do know the game? No, no. It's this amazing game. Mediocre works like this. It's just struck me, it's got a very heap like structure. It's an Australian game. In Australia, do, what do we think of the people that are fantastic at stuff? We hate them. We hate them. It's the Australian thing. We're convicts. We want to tear them down and beat them to death with a rum bottle. If anyone's good at anything except sport, we hate them. What do we think of people that are hopeless? No, we hate them too. We hate them. We completely hate them. No, no, no. We're a country full of hate. Who do we like? Average. Mediocre. That's Australian way. So this game, Mediocre, is an Australian game. What we do is we each pick a number, like I was asking you to do just then. You pick a number, don't say what it is. You pick a number and you pick a number. The American version of this game is whoever picked the biggest number wins. You can see it's just going to lead to global domination very quickly. It's not going to be good. Uh, someone's going to go infinity, someone's going to go infinity plus one. It's going to get into all those arguments about cardinality. So we're not going to do that. 14. 50. Eight. So, the biggest number, the smallest number. <laughs> you go. You're not sufficiently Australian. You are Australian. You're in the middle. Whoa. You can have a point for that. Why didn't you win? Why didn't he win? <laughs> he should have been able to win. He should have been able to win. Oh, because he called out last. He's being honest. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll play another game. Go. Think. You've all thought of numbers. Commit to them. Yep, hash them with something irrevocable, write them on a piece of paper, commit to them, go. 10. 10. 23. 23. 17. <laughs> oh, you win again! Cliff wins again! Whoa, two points to Cliff. All right, last time. Think of a number. 5. 13. Uh, 13. 5, 13, 13. Oh, well, let's tie bracket, we'll do it again. Starting at this end. 12. Oh, that was the number I picked as well. <laughs> oh. Okay, shake it up again, go. 11. 11. 11.57.99. Theo wins. Whoa! One point to Theo. But you got two points. You didn't get any points. So who wins? Theo, Theo. Theo wins. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? So, this is two level mediocre. Theo is the winner of that round. But there are three rounds to a game. And there are three games to a tournament. You can add as many levels as you want. Levels as you want. I once played this in high school with some high school kids with three levels. I reckon with three levels, I'm just playing randomly. I've got no idea till very close to the end what's going on. And there was this girl I was playing with. Lisa was her name, and she would always win. And I think she actually was able to think of three levels. Where I can think of two levels, but in three levels, I just give up. She could win in three. And she's off now doing a PhD in England. Uh, she's amazing. Actually, she always won. I only won some of the time. So. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I retrospectively can decide it was actually four level all along. Sorry, Lisa. Um, okay, so that's the game mediocre. Now, uh, going back to this heap sort thing. Here's how we can re actually represent a heap, not as a tree with, you know, cells and nodes and malleks and all that sort of extra work and housekeeping you've got to do. We can actually represent a heap in an array. And the nice thing about arrays, you know, is they give us random access lookup. We can look up in one step. Here's how we go. We put the node in the first cell. We'll number from one. It turns out to be slightly more convenient. One, two, how many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Who would have thought? Okay, we put the root in the first one, the root is one. And the rule we have is double the index, someone's index, and that's their child on the left. Double their index plus one, that's their child on the right. So what's double of one? Two, so the left child goes in two. Who's the left child? Six. Who's the right child? Three. Who's the left child of number two? 
7. Because 2 doubled is 4, so the left child of 2 is at 4. That's a 7. The right child of 2, double 2, is 4 plus 1 is 5. So we saw 6 and 5. What about this guy here? Where are his children? Well, he's at node 3, so his left child is... It's impressive? You're impressed? Yeah, it's impressive. 6. His child goes at 6, which is 10. His right child goes at 7, which is 4. And in fact, we're just passing... You can see we're just doing a breadth first search. Does that make sense? We're just doing the breadth unrolling of the whole thing. So, you see we go now 8, 42, 42, 19, 26, 7,000, and not used. The nice thing about it being a tree of type 3 is that all the not used things sit at the end. So the only structure we need for the whole thing is a pointer or an index, a number, telling us the last occupied cell, or probably the first unoccupied cell. We have some, some way of keeping track of that. And that array entirely stores the whole heap. And if you want to find anyone's child, what's the child of this 4? What's the child on the left? 7 times 2 is 14. The child on the left is 14. It, eh, oh. You missed one. I missed one. Yes. I lost one of the children. <laughs> 8, 42. 7,000 should be replaced by 29. Thank you. There we go. So the um, left child of um, node number 7 should be at node number 2 times 7, 14. It's 2, 7,000, which it is. And the right is out of the picture. Okay, that's it. So this is a very compact and fast way of representing a heap. And I'll leave it as a challenge to you. But given an array of non numbers not satisfying the heap property, it's very fast. Can you, in linear time, convert it to a heap? So could you, in place, rearrange these numbers here in linear time to make them satisfy the heap property, if they didn't already, which they do here. The heap property simply being the parents have to be greater than or equal to the children. Or, or less, depending on which way around you're going. Okay, is that cool? So everyone understands heaps? So that's a very fast way of representing a heap. So given a fast random access way of representing a heap, and noticing that a heap represents very nicely a priority queue, we can now see heap sort. Heap sort is an awesome sort. It's a comparison based sort, so it's got the n log n limit that all our comparison based sorts have. But it's in place, and it's always, it turns out, n log n. Unlike quick sort, which is fast, but sometimes can be n squared. So heap sort, we just love to bits. It's very, very good. Slightly fiddly to get right to program it. Maybe we'll have that as a, a challenge question to actually program it up. So the questions, uh, I've told you we can make a priority QADT out of uh, a heap. I've told you how we do the lookups. I haven't told you how we do inserts and deletes. How do you think you do inserts and deletes out of a heap? Yeah. Inserting from the bottom is easy. You just delete it altogether. Who said that? There you go. Yes. Well <laughs> a capacitor, if you were missing one. So deleting from the bottom is easy. How about if I wanted to delete from the middle? What do I have to do? What's that? Swap it with the um, smallest child. We have the smallest on the top? Yeah, swap it with the smallest child, move it down. Yeah, and keep repeating until it gets to the bottom, then just delete it. Well done. Oh, no. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that capacitor. <laughs> um, and if we want to delete from the top, well, it's the same as the middle, isn't it? OK, so you know how to do a delete. Think about how you could do an insert. It's, again, not very hard. Basically involves putting it at the beginning and then swapping up till it's in the right spot. So put it on the end and then just doing some swaps to get it into the right spot. You can see the swaps are easy because you know who your parents are. Who are the parents of 15? 15 div 2. What's 15 div 2? 7. So, yeah. I said parents, but in these weird world of computer science, you only have one parent, don't you? So, 7. OK, so you can see how you could just quickly swap it back to the right position. So inserts are easy, deletes are easy, uh, lookups are easy. It's easy peasy. Creating it from scratch is one slightly fiddly thing to think about, and I'm leaving that as a challenge for you guys to do. So that's a heap. We love heaps. Heaps are awesome. With heaps, we can get priority queues. With priority queues, well, you're sort of seeing priority queues popping up all over the place. Remember Prim's algorithm or Kruskal's algorithm? In Prim's algorithm, to pick the next node each time, what did you have to pick? The node with the smallest weight that satisfied some connectivity problem. So if you kept all your nodes in a heap, it would be easy peasy. OK, it gives you a nice priority queue. Oh, uh, now which had the connectivity problem, Prim or Kruskal? Uh, one of them. We're, uh, I'm just going to get them interchange. They're so similar, those two algorithms. One makes it a forest and one makes it more connected. Challenge to you. 
work out which one would benefit most from using a priority queue. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and you can have a capacitor if you work it out. Uh, all right, so we've done sorting and heap sort. We've done the array in place. We've done building as a question. All right, so in the remaining 10 minutes, I can't believe it, we've actually timed the lecture just right today. In the remaining 10 minutes, I can now show you my second way of making sure trees are balanced, which I like infinitely more than all the other ones we've seen so far. Remember, the first way, which I broke into two subways, was... Was... Ooh, ow. Um, was having, was uh, like just doing some mechanical operations to detect when it's out of order and putting it back in order and either doing it all up front in one big lump and amortizing the cost or just doing a little bit of time, a little bit of work every time moving towards it. But here's another way that doesn't try and have this grand control, doesn't try and control what's going on but just relaxes and says, ah, manana man. It's based on the same idea as randomized quicksort. The idea goes something like this. If we could create a tree randomly, if we could insert the elements into a tree into a random order, rather than the order generated by the pro some process that's not completely random, then with high probability the tree would be balanced. So let's see if we can construct a random tree independently of the order of the operations used to insert the elements into the tree. And if we can do that, then our tree will be random and any lack of entropy in the order in which they're inserted will not, destroy, will not affect its structure at all, so will not taint and unbalance our tree. That's a very roundabout way of saying it, so let me now say it more concretely. Let's actually do it. First of all, I have a puzzle for you. Here are some numbers. One, two, four, nine, <laughs> six, 32, 17, 13. Can you, four, a mystery prize, arrange these into a binary tree. That is ordered and a heap. Arrange them into a binary tree that simultaneously satisfies the binary tree ordering property and the heap property. So, in other words, all children to the left of the parent have to be smaller than it, all children to the right have to be bigger than it, and all children have to be, let's say, smallest on the top, all children have to be um, smaller than or, oh, sorry, all children have to be bigger than or equal to their parents. You screwing up your face? Can, no, no, they're not mutually exclusive. Can you arrange these... What's it going to look like? It's going to be a line. Ah. What if? Shh, 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 shh. Can everyone see that? And can you see it will always be possible to satisfy both properties simultaneously. One says smaller things have to be on top. One says smaller things have to be to the left. So you're going to have a line where the smallest thing is the top and leftmost and the biggest thing is bottom and rightmost and everything in between is along the same diagonal. What if I... What if we pick some names? Everyone just... What's your name? Oh, no, I, no, I already know your name. I don't know your name. What's your name? David. David. <laughs> All right, the person who said, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Was that you? Uh, lemon. Uh, uh, lemon. L -E <laughs> Lemon? Yeah. Awesome. Is there a story behind that name? Um, no. Like your parents like lemons or something? He's just a sour Oh, you swap names. Oh, <laughs> everyone swap names. All right, everyone. Well, I'm not looking. Just shuffle the names around. Okay. All right. You guys, I'm going to write a note to your mum. Lemon? <laughs> this is what we used to do at school. Yeah, what's your name? David. David. <laughs> if you could pick any name you wanted out of the three of your names that hasn't already been said, what would it be? Lewis. What's that? Lewis. <laughs> okay, you guys are stretching my brain. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick some... Uh, so at the, yeah, your name. The guy um, leaning on your chin. Say it again. How do I spell that? A-N-U-J. A -N -U -J. Ah, good. We're going to be doing things alphabetically, so it's good to get some A's. And next to you?
Okay. And next one along. Yeah. yeah NAV. NAV. And next one along. Andrew. And all the way along, the guy in the yellow and black jacket. Mike. Mike. Thanks, Mike. All right, guys. Can you arrange these pairs into a tree so that the numbers, keep the pairs together, assume these are the identity numbers of these people, so that the numbers form a heap and the names form an ordered tree. It's doable. It's doable. Do it. Do it. You should be able to do it really quickly. It's a perfect exam question. So we regard this as exam revision. Arrange these eight tuples into something that's simultaneously a tree, an ordered tree by this property, and a min heap. Min heap means minimum on the top. Min heap by this property. Is everyone going? Go, 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 go. I'll give you like three minutes to do it. Give it a shot. You might as well. Three minutes of your life, well spent. Regardless, three minutes of exam practice. Wave your hand if you've got a question, if you don't get the problem. I'll come and just explain it to you. Yeah. You're drawing a binary tree. Right. You're placing those pairs in the tree, numbers and names. So they belong together as blobs. It has to be an ordered tree by the name property and a heap by the number property. By ordered name. So, yeah, if I, did a, if I printed out the tree in order, I'd get all the names in alphabetical order. If I went down the tree like a heap, I'd get them in a, in a yeah. Does that make sense? Give it a try. Yeah, good. I'll give you a hint. What goes on the top? One. There's only one that can go on the top. There can only be one. There can be only one. There can be one. This is from Highlander, isn't it? Did anyone watch Highlander? And like he, he gets some magical power if he's the last one. And then they have all these sequels where he's, he's not the last one anymore. Did that make sense? It didn't make sense to me. I stopped watching the sequels after a while. I thought there was only one, and now there's two. What's going on? So we'll put one at the top. So one Lewis definitely goes at the top. Right, who goes on the next layer down? One, oh, one lemon, sorry. One lemon. Not possible? Try. Lu you think what? Lewis goes to the right. You think? Well, no, one has to be at the top because the heat property is that smaller numbers go above. So one can't be the child of anyone. So one had to go at the top. Well, this is this so far. This so far, this subtree satisfies that property. The names are in alphabetical order and the numbers are in heap order. Where does, where does Anuj go? I think it does too. Is that making sense so far? Where does... Sorry. Where does... Who am I going to insert next? Nav. Where does Nav go? Six Nav. Who am I going to insert now? Nail into the left. N A. No, I can't go to the left of Lewis. 
I can't put him down here because N-A-L-I-N comes alphabetically after Lewis. So he has to go on the right side of Lewis. So he'll have to go down here. It turns out that you can do this, and I knew you could before we started, because you can always do it. It turns out there's precisely one way, if we ignore duplicates, there's precisely one way of arranging tuples like this into a structure that's simultaneously a tree and a heap. If it's simultaneously a tree and a heap, we call it a tree. There's precisely one way of arranging items into a tree. <coughs> Can I just point out that that is a magic property? That gives us everything we've dreamed of. There's only one way of putting them into a tree means there is only one tree you can get out of all of these elements, regardless of the order in which you insert them into the tree. The shape of the tree is determined by the set of elements in the tree and is independent of the order in which the tree was constructed. This means whether David came first to be entered into my database or Nalan or Nav or Lewis, after they've all been added, regardless of what order they came in, I'm going to get exactly the same structure. And we've seen part of the structure here. Can you see how that's very exciting? It means the shape of the tree is independent of the structure, of the order. So if we can make that shape a random shape, it will be independent of the order in which the items are inserted. And en lack of entropy in the way that Maurice buys clothes or in which his assistant scans them in will be irrelevant. On average, we will have a randomly structured tree, which you know with high probability, only you know because I told you and you believe me because you are trusting, uh, will be on average, it will be, in lo not on average, with high probability it will be sufficiently balanced to give us li uh, logarithmic access times. So, sh 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 here's how we make a tree. You want to insert a whole lot of names into a tree, and you want that tree to be average, on average to be balanced. Every time you get a new name to add to the tree, you generate a random heap weight. And you attach it to that name. And that heap weight stays attached to that name forever. And then you just insert it in so it satisfies simultaneously the tree and the heap property. And there's, that is, the structure of this thing depends entirely on the random weight you just generated, not on the fact that it was the last thing you added in. What this means now is I can create the structures a random balanced tree by just creating random weights, inserting things in with the random weights, and then you can delete and add and delete and add and delete and add as much as you want, and at any given instant, you will end up with a tree which consists of a set of random weights, so it will have a random structure. So at any instant, regardless of what order you add things or delete things, your tree will, with high probability, be balanced. I love this completely. It's what we call a randomized data structure. We'll see some more later on. The random laws of the universe keep it balanced. We don't have to do housekeeping. We don't have to have a grand central master controller. Question one. Is there always going to be a tree? Yep, there's always going to be a unique way of doing it for every. Test it out yourself. Where do we put 17? Where do we put 17? Oh, a challenge. I like that. 17, uh, what have we put in so far? Nine, so we're up to 17. So 17, Mike. So it's less than Nalan, so it's over here. Contain Mike. Satisfies the heat property, satisfies the tree property. It's always one way of doing it. Absolutely beautiful. I love systems like this. They look after themselves. We don't need someone managing them. Hopefully that's how your group work is going to work from now on. I'll see you on Thursday, guys. Good luck. Where? Yahweh, the barn, you